All right, guys, so today we're doing somewhat of a small uh, review, or should I say update, of what it's like to own a Ford GT after adding about 700 to 800 miles on the car. Uh, a lot of things have happened that basically have reminded me why this could be probably one of the most exciting and awesome cars that has come out in the last 10 years. And that's a pretty big statement. Hey guys, welcome back to Exotic Car Hacks. And today we are doing this. That's right, this is driving my, holy shit, my Ford GT, uh, the incredible 2019 uh, all carboned out for GT. I love this car, absolutely love it. It's just incredible. It's not without fault, but it is just an incredible car. And so, we are uh, driving it today because I don't know if you recall, we could never do an in-car review of this car originally when I got it a couple of months back because our friend Reggie here, who's still literally over me, you can still see him here. You see, we're literally touching in the weirdest and gayest of ways uh, here sitting in the car, a car truly not meant for heavyweights or should I say larger individuals, but apparently Reggie has now lost 100 pounds so he's able to fit in the car. Originally, we were on top of each other, so it was consuming both seats, but now only one seat. Isn't that right, Reggie? That's correct. Oh, well, at least you see, for once, he agreed, he agreed. Anyways, so today we are actually driving and we're going to talk about what is so incredible and should I say not so incredible about the Ford GT because I had a lot of mixed feelings about this car. You know, when I originally drove it, I said, I don't know about the EcoBoost and all these little things. I don't know what makes it better or worse, like some things are good, some things are not. I really couldn't get around to really telling you how good or bad it was. It just was kind of like something unique. And then over time, we discovered what really made it unique. And, and I'll put it in short this way. Ford beat Ferrari Le Mans. You watch the whole like Ford versus Ferrari thing. And that was their first thing, but they never let go of this beef with Ferrari, which is really interesting to me because this car was not about winning Le Mans or it wasn't like back in the whole like this one Le Mans again against Ferrari like there's so many new teams competing it doesn't even matter anymore but what did matter is um, it was almost like a F you to Ferrari again because it does the exact same thing as what the LaFerrari does but it did it for half the price so they were basically like again making a point that they can do something better and it doesn't have to cost as much money and make it accessible to more people so again it to me was an indirect insult to Ferrari for releasing this car. So we saw in the review, and you can refer back to it, we have it in the in the description, that the seats don't move. So basically this moves, the, the bottom moves, and it takes time getting used to it because now the dynamic of where you are compared to your seating position is that the seat's always in the center of the car and it feels like the front of it is much larger than it is. But it's just an interesting thing. It takes time to get used to. That's okay. It actually makes the, the experience much more interesting and exciting. The second piece we talked about that was kind of weird were how cheap the keys were, how cheap the buttons were here. You know, like everything just doesn't really feel mighty expensive, right? However, we did talk about how the infotainment worked phenomenally, well, like better than most of the other infotainments and the Bluetooth works fantastic and everything is there. So w the lift works instantly. Like there's so much good in this car from a practical, usable standpoint. And that's one of the reasons I think that it makes this car so extraordinary. It's an incredible race car with a very docile yet exciting daily drivability factors. So that's what we got out of Ford basically with the new Ford GT. Eco Boost or not, this has the factory Acropovic and it sounds fantastic. So everything there is there. The experience is there. There are few flaws there and there. The feeling, the driving, even the steering wheel feel is good. It's, it's very rough, like meaning it, it's a very tight steering wheel, which feels good, uh, especially because of the type of car it is, potentially because of the tires. But, you know, one of the things we haven't really talked about is really what doesn't work in this car or where I think Ford made significant mistakes with this car. So, you know, like I've said this about other cars where I said they do a really good job and then last minute someone comes in and completely 
Fs that up because one person made a comment that they shouldn't have made about the car. And an argument would be like, how can we have a daily drivable car if we don't have cruise control? So this is an argument where you go, well, yeah, you need cruise control. Well, I think since 1990, no one in their right mind uses cruise control unless it's like some self-driving bullshit or super cruise. But usually you don't go on a road trip more than an hour, especially because Reggie doesn't fit in the car. So I'm sure that most American men's fat wives won't fit in this car either. And if you're usually old and redneck, you usually drive Mustangs and Corvettes and then... The seat, these seats are extremely comfortable. Yeah, they're comfortable. But what I'm saying is I'm, I'm not comfortable because you're holding over me. But I'm saying if you're a, a very lonely man and you have a very large, heavy set wife that's white and let herself go 20 years ago, then you're most likely achieved the status in your life where you've raised to a 4GT level I'm not the typical 4GT driver. I'm saying that guy potentially is going to be struggling with doing long road trips with this, not because he can't get head, but because he can't move. Like clearly, and we're not in a moving situation here, right? Anyways, we got off tangent here. So anyway, back to where we we're talking about cruise control. So forget the comment about the redneck thing. Maybe it's not you. Okay, whatever. Redneck it's not good. Okay, all right. Anyways, all right. Well, no, rednecks can afford these cars. I mean, what are you talking about? There's plenty of redneck. This is a 700k car, no, 600k car, and it sells used for a million dollars. But there are some rednecks out there that make good money. I mean, they make good money, they can afford stuff like this. Like, like Trump? No, yeah, but Trump's not like, a, I mean, he looks like a redneck. Well, I guess, yeah, that's, uh, anyways. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess you would say that, yeah. But I don't think he would buy this, because this isn't comfortable. But anyways, back, to, I don't know how we got off topic, and it just completely, like, sorry for completely wasting your time on this. We're back to the review. What I was saying is you don't really need cruise control. So why am I saying cruise control or I'm like picking this bone with cruise control? Well, simply put, if you look right here in front of me, you will see this very active steering wheel. What do I mean by active? There's just too much crap going on. So on one side, you have all this, you have these blinkers here, you have your volume and radio here, and you have your cruise control and menu options here. You have your wipers here. And then you, again, here you have your little modes and here you have your little buttons. So there's nothing wrong with having a bunch of stuff on the steering wheel, except when you're actually driving. Because half the times I'm trying to blink, I turn on the volume to the music. So while I'm trying to blink to go left or right, instead I'm pressing the volume and I'm hearing more music, yeah. problem. And when I'm at Starbucks trying to get coffee and I go lower on the volume, because that's what I want to do, I, by accident I'm turning on my blinker. So the problem one, everything on this car is way too close together on the steering wheel. Well, half of this stuff doesn't need to be in the steering wheel. I think one thing we can learn from McLaren and Ferrari, they've done a good job at using the back of the steering wheel here for not so reliable or necessary or, or usable options that maybe like the wipers, you're not driving that much in rain. So that stuff can go in the back because it really doesn't need to be right here in the forefront of things, right? So I think that's problem one. The driving experience is hindered significantly because of this weird, awkward steering wheel. That's first problem so the second problem I had with this car as a whole which again is subjective to your usage of the car is that you know I told you before the materials are cheap and it doesn't have to be and one of the things I hate that manufacturers do is even when they make a supercar they basically recycle parts from other cars so like we know that this this knob is the same that's in the Mustang and so on and so forth so it doesn't need to be this is a car that's incredibly expensive and while I would argue 100% that every single person that has bought this car could certainly afford an extra $5,000 in good aesthetical options, such as good buttons or, or something new. We saw this with Maserati 2. They made the MC20, the new thing, we reviewed this. And, and again, the MC20, a very, very flagship car for the brand using uh, Maserati Ghibli parts in it. Like, why? Why are you making a quarter million dollar car and fitting it with a $30,000 variant, like with buttons on the steering wheel and everything else being cheap and feeling very, very trashy? So it didn't make sense to me. And I didn't understand what Ford did this, especially on such a limited run. They could have spiced it up on a few things on the inside, really giving it that extra exciting look, despite keeping a simpler model. Like Ford buttons and things obviously aren't always going to be uh, the most exciting or intricate of details, but they can still be better in a 600K variant when everything else in the line sells for 100K or below, right? 
So it didn't make sense for why they did that. And then the last thing I'll leave you with about one thing that really didn't work with this car is the gas tank. So the gas tank you know, on a normal non-race day will do somewhere around 130 to 150 miles. So it's very small. And it tells you you need gas every time it hits basically half tank. Well, the problem is if you drive more than just your office, which is three miles away from your house, you probably need a tank of gas every single time you drive this car out for anything greater than going to work. So that didn't make sense either because they were talking about making a supercar that could be drivable and usable. So then came the argument back to the cruise control and why I'm having such a bone with this cruise control thing. If the issue is that you're making a car and you're saying cruise control is now so usable because people will go on long road trips, then you're counteracting that by putting a gas tank so small that it's taking the racing part of it as the priority for the car. So if that was the case, then the argument was you didn't really need cruise control, which is why I've argued that probably the only reason we have cruise control and so much crap on the steering wheel is probably because of Karen at the, at the manufacturing plant said, wait a minute, or at the design center said, well, this is a problem. We need to have cruise control because some people will do that. But on a car so limited, the real argument is one, do you need it for the majority of its drivers? And two, will they need it going forward, especially when the tank barely gives you 130 miles worth of driving? So this is basically my conclusion with the Ford GT. One, one of the most historic and incredible cars of its time, incredibly fast, incredibly exciting, incredibly good sounding, and one of the best driving experiences you can buy anywhere under a million bucks. It's different than anything else. It looks different than anything else. It sounds different than anything else. And it's just a really exciting car. And that's a really important to note. And even though it has these little flaws like every other car, I don't think they're enough to prevent it from saying that this is probably the most important car of the century when it comes to race cars on the road because of what it can do, what it is, and more important than anything else, how it makes you feel. So again, don't forget it. If you want to learn how to drive cars like these without losing the money, in many cases actually making money, click the link in the description and learn how to hack cars. In as little as 90 days, you could buy your first exotic car. And listen, more important than anything else, if you're already an exotic car owner, you already know this information and you just want to network with 20,000 of the most incredible exotic car owners in the world who literally focus more on the diversity of the money in exotics rather than anything else, join our community. The link is also in the description. Now, hope you've enjoyed this review. And again, I apologize for the camera being so close. As you can see, Reggie and I struggle a lot with this. Uh, you look, show them how much, look at it, look at this. This is a problem. Like, like if you're going somewhere, you can't be taken seriously. If this is happening, like if you get out of the car like this and you're like, yeah. Don't think I'm this bodyguard. Yeah, but, but like the bodyguard, when it fits more in the car and the guy that you're supposed to bodyguard is dying because he's under you is not going to work. Anyways, we'll catch you guys next time. Another video for exotic car hacks. And don't forget, eat salmon. What, what do you say you ate? Sa uh, fish, fish and, and green. Okay, anyways, this isn't the cooking channel. We'll catch you next time on Exotic Car.